What an interesting time to be alive. A couple of weeks ago, I released a video about uh, putting Arc OS on the XF40H, and it's been quite popular. Several people have actually done it. Several people have said that they actually like it, and a few people came back and said that they'd had a few problems. Now, unbeknownst to me, a couple of days before I released that video, whilst I was still producing mine, um, somebody actually put something on GitHub which is a completely fresh install of Arc OS for this very device. In fact, it covers the XF40H, the XF35H, my Mini, I think they may mean the MiU Mini, I'm not sure, uh, the R36 Pro slash K36 Panel 1, R36 Max, the HG36, the R36 Ultra, but only the V1 panels are supported, uh, the R36T, the K36S, the RX6H, the A10 Mini, and various R36 clones. And I think, I think somebody at the back's just shouted, bingo, congratulations, sir, you've on a weekend in an elevator with Bridget Bardot, <clears throat> as she is now. This repository solves a few of the problems that people were having with the higher-end systems. First of all, there seems to be a problem with the sticks, in that the original install, the left stick, would move forwards and backwards, the right stick would move left and right, and your character would move in such a bizarre way that it's probably invented the next TikTok dance craze. Clearly, they weren't mapped properly, uh, somewhere along the line at least. You could fix it in RetroArch, but then I realised that this was also a problem in Drastic as well, so I, I needed to find a solution. Well, this software fixes that completely. Now, there's still a couple of issues uh, that we'll have to dive into, and this is a longer setup than the original one, purely because there are a few extra things that you're going to want to change, not least the controls for PlayStation 1. But we'll get into that a little bit later on. It also solves a problem with the audio, which was that it was a little bit too quiet in the previous version. However, I have to say that that might be different on different versions of the console, because I never had the audio problems that other people did. And I've heard from some people who also hadn't had those problems, so I'm still not entirely sure what was going on there. Your mileage may vary, that's what I'm saying. But it was working well for me. But just like pulling on your favourite coat to find out that the dog's been sick in the pocket, there is another audio issue here that we're going to have to talk about. It's easy to fix, it's annoying, and if you don't know it's there, you might think that the audio has packed its bags and emigrated. Anyway, we'll get into all of this in the video. First things first, you're going to need some software. If you've still got 7-Zip and Rufus installed from last time, then you're already halfway there. If not, grab them both now. The links are in the description as always. You'll also want your BIOS files and your ROM files ready to go, exactly the same as before. Obviously, I can't tell you where to find these, but I trust that you're resourceful enough to work that out on your own. You are also going to need to download the three files from the linked GitHub repository that end in xz.7z.00 and then a number, either one, two, and three. And one final very important thing, this relies on you running a .exe file. So if you're not on Windows or you can't open that file, I'm afraid you can't do this natively. I'm very sorry about that. And whilst you're downloading and installing all of this, Let's have a ding dong. Right, let's get straight into this. If you followed my previous video, then you're going to need to start from scratch. I know that sounds like the technological equivalent of being told to turn around after climbing halfway up a mountain, but this is a completely different build and we can't just update over the top of the old one. So we're back to square one, but this time with the benefit of hindsight and a build uh, that we know works, kind of. So this is where things are going to get slightly different from last time. For the previous build, you downloaded one file. For this build, you're going to need to download three files from GitHub. They're all part of the same archive, and they all end in .xz.7z.something. You need all three of them in the exact same folder before you can extract anything. It's like assembling furniture, where the instructions insist that you need every single piece before you start, except this time they're actually right. 
If you didn't get those earlier, the link to the GitHub page is in the description below. Go there, scroll down to these files, and then grab all three of them that have the extension that we've talked about. And once you've got all three sitting together in a folder, we can move to the extraction. Right click on the first file, the one that ends in 001, and under the 7-zip option, choose Extract Files. 7-zip is clever enough to know that all three files are part of the same archive, so it'll automatically use all three parts to extract the images you need. This takes a few minutes because it's quite large, so this is the perfect opportunity to put the kettle on and, and then take it off again because you realize you look silly. Once the extraction is done, you should have a new file. This is what we're going to flash onto your SD card. So get your SD card ready. And remember what I said last time about size. You need something that's decent because this is your operating system and all your games all on one card. I'm using a 64 gig card for testing. But if you've got a proper game collection, then you'll want at least 128 gig or even 256 gig if you're feeling ambitious. Pop your SD card into your computer and then fire up Rufus. Select your device from the drop down at the top, making absolutely certain it's the correct card because we're about to wipe it completely. Click Select, find the ArcOS 4 clone image file that you've just extracted and then click Start. Rufus will give you a warning that everything on the card is about to be deleted. You click OK at this point if you're happy with that, and then you let Rufus do its thing. This takes a few minutes, so feel free to scroll through your phone or contemplate the existential dread of modern life or whatever it is you do to pass the time. When Rufus finishes, you'll see a drive on your computer labelled boot. Do not eject the card yet because we've got one more critical step to do. Inside that boot drive, you'll find a file called dtb underscore selector dot exe. Double click on that and a command prompt window will open up. Press enter on the first screen, then press one to select the ZFAN option. On the next screen, press five for the XF40H specifically, then press one again to choose English as your language. The program will close itself down automatically. And at that point, you can safely eject the SD card. Take that SD card, slot it into your XF40H and power it on. What happens next is going to test your patience more thoroughly than a traffic jam on a Friday evening. The device will boot and you'll see text scrolling by, progress bars filling up and screens changing in ways that make absolutely no sense. At several points it will look completely broken. The screen might go black, it might show strange colours, it might show the roll variety performance, I don't know. It might sit there doing nothing for what feels like an eternity. Do not panic, do not turn it off, just wait. The entire process takes some somewhere between five to 10 minutes, and your only job is to leave it alone and let it do its work. Eventually, the device will boot into Emulation Station, and you'll see the Arc OS interface on that lovely big screen. And at this point, shut it down properly by pressing the Start button to open the menu, then go down to Quit, and then select Shutdown. We're not done yet because once the device is off, you need to take the SD card out, put it back in your computer. Now, this is where things can get a little bit complex, but it's nothing that you can't handle, I promise. You should see a drive called boot, but you probably won't see a drive called easy ROMs, even though it actually exists on the card. Windows has decided to be difficult about showing it to you, so we need to give it a gentle nudge in the right direction. Right click on the Windows logo in the bottom left hand corner of your screen and choose Disk Management. Find your SD card in the list, it'll be the one marked as removable that has the boot partition visible. And you're going to have a little letter by the side of that as well. That's the boot drive's letter. You're also going to see another partition labeled Easy ROMs, but it won't have that drive letter assigned. So what you're going to do is right click on that on the Easy ROMs partition and choose change drive letter and paths. Click add, then click OK without changing anything. Windows is going to assign a drive letter and suddenly you'll be able to see the Easy ROMs folder in File Explorer.
Open up that Easy ROMs drive and you'll find the same folder structure as before. A BIOS folder for your system files and subfolders for every other system imaginable. Copy your BIOS files into the BIOS folder and then sort your game ROMs into the appropriate systems folders. Game Boy goes in GB, for example, NES is NES, and so on and so forth. Take your time with this because once you've done it, you won't need to do it again unless you're adding new games or taking some away. When you're done copying the files, safely eject the SD card, put it back in the XF40H and power it on. Emulation Station will scan through all of your new games and populate the menus. Navigate around, admire your collection, and then we need to address that audio issue that I mentioned earlier. Here's the quirk with this build, and it's one that I warned you about at the very start. The sound is off by default every single time you boot this device up. If you start a game right now, you'll get the perfect visuals and complete silence, which is the gaming equivalent of watching a mine performance. To fix it, you need to be in the main ArcOS menu, navigate to Options, go to the Clone folder, and then find Toggle Audio. Press A on that, and after a second, it'll, the screen will go black, and then you'll get booted back into the ArcOS screen that you've just left, and the sound should be on. Now, as you click around the interface, you should actually start hearing those clicking sounds. The downside is that every single time you boot the device, you will need to go back into this folder, toggle the audio to turn it off, and then toggle the audio again to turn it back on. I don't know why it does it, but that does solve the problem, at least in the short term. While you're in this options clone menu, you can also set your LED preferences if you want, although I've never had any luck with these at all. Navigate to Joy LED and choose whichever colour scheme appeals to you most. These settings aren't quite as comprehensive as what you get on the stock firmware, and I just couldn't make it work properly. They always just seem to be green for me. But personally, I keep the LEDs off in these machines anyway, because I prefer it. You know, I like my gaming devices to look like they're sulking in the corner rather than hosting a disco. Now, we need to set up your Wi-Fi, and this is pleasantly straightforward. Move down to Wi-Fi in the Options menu, and then press A. Choose Connect to a new Wi-Fi connection, select your network from the list, and then enter your password. Once it's connected, it'll drop you back into the network selection screen. Press Start and select Together to enter out of this menu. And there's something odd about this build. If you now go into the RetroArch menu, it doesn't seem to recognize that Wi-Fi is turned on. But it is on, and it works perfectly fine, and it seems to turn itself on every time you boot up the device. So don't worry about that. You can set up the Scraper right from the main ArcOS menu without any problems. You press Start, head to Scraper, press A, and then enter your username and password for the Screen Scraper. Once that's done, you can use Scrape to grab box art for all of your games. Now, right now, we're going to sort out retro art, and this is important because there are some quality of life improvements that will make your gaming experience significantly better. The thing to remember is that ArcOS uses two different versions of RetroArch. There's RetroArch and RetroArch 32, and they run different emulators depending on what system you're playing. The system will automatically choose the right version of RetroArch to start when you start a game, but it means that you'll want to make changes to RetroArch settings and you're going to need to do it twice, I'm afraid. Once in RetroArch, once in RetroArch 32. It's tedious, but it only takes a few minutes, and if you do the same thing for both from the main menu, you never have to do it again. So select RetroArch and press A. Navigate to Settings, and then Input, and then Hotkeys. Now scroll down to Fast Forward, press the A button, and hold down R2 until it confirms. Then go to the Rewind, press A again, hold down L2, and these settings mean that you can now speed up or rewind your games by holding down the shoulder buttons whilst you've got the Select button pressed, which is an incredibly useful thing to do for grinding through those boring sections or fixing mistakes. Back out to the Input menu by pressing B, and then scroll all the way down to Confirm Quit and make sure that's turned off. That's the little toggle should be off. 
This changes the quit behavior so you only need to press select and start once instead of twice, which just makes it easier to quit when you actually want to. If you're into retro achievements, you can set those up as well. You go to settings, then achievements, and then turn it on. Make sure hardcore mode is turned off unless you're some sort of masochist. I have heard that if you leave hard mode on, then the Cenobites from Hellraiser appears and they challenge you to a game of shove halfpenny every time you just want five minutes on Super Mario. Enter your username and your password for retro achievements and you are done. Now we need to save this configuration. So press B and back out to the main settings menu, navigate to configuration file, select save current configuration and press A. And then you back out to the main menu with the B button again, select quit to return to the Arc OS menu. And now you do the entire thing again for RetroArc 32. I know it's repetitive, but it's worth doing, I promise. Now this next bit is important, especially if you're planning to play PlayStation games. You wanna make sure that the DualShock controller is set as the standard instead of the basic PlayStation controller. This is one of those things that isn't immediately obvious, but it makes a massive difference to your gaming experience, especially playing games like Ape Escape. Start any PlayStation game. Open the quick menu by pressing select and X together. Navigate to controls. Go into port one controls and then change the device type to DualShock. And then you go back to the main controls menu, choose manage remap files and select save core remap file. And this applies the DualShock settings to all games running on the PSX core, which means that you only have to do this once and only for one version of RetroArch. Now, some games weren't quite built for DualShock and don't run so well on this setting. So you will need to remember what you're doing here. And you just run through the same process again to turn it back to standard when you're playing those games. And then I put it back to DualShock again once you're done. And then that brings us to Portmaster, which is one of the best reasons to use custom firmware in the first place. From the main ArcOS menu, go to Options, then Tools, then select Portmaster. The first time you run it, the system's going to install or update files, so be patient and then press A when it asks. You'll see the system reinitialize, then a disclaimer screen will appear. You've got to wait 15 seconds here and press A to continue. When it's finished, let's just install the game. Navigate to ready to run ports and press A, find a game you want to install, press A to see the information about it, then press A again to install it. Some ports require additional game files and the information screen will tell you exactly what you need and where to put it. And once you've installed your ports, exit Portmaster using the exit function. An emulation station will now reload itself at that point and the new games will appear automatically in the ports section of the main ArcOS menu after that. So there we have it, a new build of ArcOS for the XF40H that fixes the analog stick mapping issue and addresses the audio problems from the previous version, with only a minor inconvenience of having to toggle it on and off every time you boot up. If you followed my original video, I apologize for the timing of the release. If you're coming to this fresh, then congratulations on having the good sense to wait for the updated version. And it's probably a good idea to keep an eye on that GitHub repository in case they drop any changes. The XF40H with this build of ArcOS is exactly what I'd hoped that it would be. It's responsive, capable, perfectly suited to that gorgeous four inch display. If this has helped you out, give it a thumbs up and let me know in the comments how you get on with the new build. And if you spot any other issues that I've managed to miss this time, do let me know before I make another mistake video, before I make another video about it. But that's it for now. Until next time, thanks ever so much for watching. I hope this has helped you out. And of course, happy gaming.